Hi and welcome to episode 72 of Shaman Talk. My name is Rhonda and I'm your host. And this is the third of our Drama Triangle series and this week we're looking at the role of the persecutor. I would say that in all of the roles of the Drama Triangle, I think this is the role that most people find difficulty with. So I I in the days gone in days gone by when we can actually run in person courses, um I ran a drama triangle course, a day course, um, using the concepts of the drama triangle along with shamanic work. And this was the role that everybody struggled with. This was the role that people just could not identify with. It just wasn't safe. And when people did realise that they took on persecutor roles, it was often very shocking and upsetting. So, trigger warning at the beginning. I will mention things that you might find triggering. The whole podcast might be triggering for you. It might be difficult for you to realise that you are persecuting against other people. But the only way through, the only way out is through. The only way to overcome these problem behaviours is to recognise them and move past them. So the drama triangle um, originally came out of a counselling modality called transactional analysis. Stephen Cartman first discussed this model of human interaction in 1968, so a long time ago. But it's the drama triangle has really become a widely used tool for helping people to understand and move away from negative patterns of interaction and communication. And you can recognise if you're in a drama triangle by thinking about arts that feel like a drama. It's really simple. Is there a common script? I feel like I'm going round in circles. I've definitely been here before or here we go again. And if you stop and pause for a moment, for a moment, could you tell how it was going to end? And the three roles of the drama triangle, the victim, which was week one, the saviour or rescuer, which was week two, and the perpetrator or persecutor, it's week three this week, are all about getting our needs met. However, the driving force behind those needs is always negative in the case of the drama triangle. The roots of the roles are found in pain, negative beliefs, shame, insecurity, that kind of thing. So by examining each of these roles, we can begin to escape the drama triangle. And don't forget that one person can occupy more than one role in in the space of one argument, you can jump around these roles quite quickly. When you occupy one, someone will shift and occupy another. It's very dynamic. You're not one or another. You can be all. And most people do exhibit all of the traits at one time or another. Um, Perhaps most people will exhibit one more than any other. I'd say that... I would like to think that the saviour archetype was my very was my very worst um, archetype that I had to deal with. But victim and persecutor equally, really, probably. I would say that um, there's probably, it's good not to put too much emphasis on one or the other, but give each um, equal mind space to think about. The other thing to remember about the drama triangle is that it can be internal or external. So external means that there are other people in your drama and internal means that the drama is with just within you and involves the messages that we're given ourselves. So you can be your own victim, saviour and perpetrator within your mind. Okay, so let's get specific about the persecutor. Persecutors tend to blame others and criticise others without providing guidance, assistance, or offering a solution to the underlying problem. Persecutors can be critical and unpleasant. They can deny their own weakness and focus on the weaknesses and problems of others, lecturing, preaching, criticising with offence, demeaning or sarcastic comments. That's how they tend to communicate. Um, persecutors are often very patronising. 
Now, later on in the podcast, I'm going to go into some detail about different types of persecutors that you you may exhibit those behaviours or you may recognise in others, or both. So persecutors behave in a way that others are inconvenienced by or suffer from. They discount the feelings and importance of the person who are affected because of their actions and they cannot usually hear or accept or know. So there are elements of um, narcissism in the persecutor. And for those of you who have suffered from narcissist, narcissists, this is probably another... I'm just going to say some things about that now, but as we trigger warning for anybody who struggles with that word. But the word narcissist is overused um, or is certainly misunderstood, I think. There's a... there there are narcissistic personality traits which often match and or or can be described as persecutor traits which are different <clears throat> to a narcissistic personality disorder narcissistic people with narcissistic personality disorders are r- rarer than people think especially as that word narcissist is bandied around so often we will all have narcissistic tendencies we will all be on that scale. Occasionally, having a narcissistic tendency is not necessarily a bad thing, especially when it comes to having, um, if you're trying to kind of gain more confidence in your life or build boundaries, people who you come up against may call you a narcissist for that. There's just, it's a very nuanced, difficult area. Um, so I just want to throw that word into the mix because as I go through some of these description some of you might be thinking oh that sounds like a narcissist it's certainly narcissistic in its energy I could say that so persecutors can be aggressive angry judgmental they can use put downs shame and blame manipulation or covert put downs as well so the same as you can have overt and covert narcissists you can have overt and covert persecutors the, the sideward looks, the silent treatment, the withholding of affection. It's very covert. And a persecutor's motivations are control. I must be okay, I must be better, I must be stronger. And power. If I can feel more powerful than you, then it will prove I'm not weak or insignificant. So let's go into some detail about what a persecutor, what different types of persecutors are. So you've got the classic active persecutor, right? They use their energy to get their perceived needs met, which is fine, except that they do it in a way that often others will suffer. So they're loud, in your face, can be physically or verbally aggressive, or deliberately do something to hurt or inconvenience someone else. They tend to blame, shame, there tends to be no support or active encouragement or support from an active persecutor. Okay, so a retaliatory persecutor aims to punish and and, and then experience triumph from punishing. So, and they're also likely to believe that their actions are justifiable. So, for example, you know, you get your neighbour's car towed because it's parked in the wrong place rather than just going over and speaking to them about it so it's that kind of getting back at people behavior it can be very passive aggressive so retaliatory persecutors for example might forget to do something for your spouse when you're angry with them you don't really forget but you just don't do it because you're angry it can also be using the silent treatment now, to me, the silent treatment is something that I have used to great effect, I have to say, in the past. Um, and it's awful. And I see a lot of men and women using the silent treatment. You've hurt me, therefore I am not going to talk to you. I'm going to withdraw my communication. I'm going to withdraw my affection. And you are going to suffer for however long I choose to give you the silent treatment for. So whether you use the silent treatment or you suffer from someone who uses the silent treatment it's not okay so if you are someone who uses the silent treatment as a way to punish people then 
something that you can look at maybe you can speak to a counsellor maybe you can read about it you know it depends on the, the how difficult you would find to find it to overcome that and to communicate instead if you are at the mercy of someone who uses silent treatment boundaries we need to talk you need to have a think about your boundaries this is not okay for me you need to communicate with me we need to sort this out silent treatment is not something I want in my relationships so a pattern then there's a passive persecutor which is kind of like what we flip into um, when so this is connected to the drama triangle in a big way so a, somebody who's passive in their persecution is probably a victim first and foremost and then flips into a persecutor so it's not punishment it's not necessarily their intent but they are willing to discount others at a level that results in their suffering in the other people's suffering so for example a worker a co-worker is so caught up in a personal crisis or a problem at work or something that is a real problem for them in a kind of that victim state that he creates stress, extra work and anxiety for his workmates. That's a passive persecutor who's probably very deeply in the victim role and then becomes a persecutor because of that. And if you think about it, when you are around someone who's in that deep victim energy, that deep victim state, it can be really overwhelming to be on the receiving end of that energy or to be in close proximity to that energy. It's not pleasant. And then you've got the persecutor in disguise. And these are the guys that are usually saviours and the saviours that flip. So these are the terribly nice people that may genuinely seem to love and care or do love and care for you. But actually as we've discussed already in the Saviour podcast, they covertly seek to control and make you exactly as they wish or to control the situation as exactly as they want to. They often will be trying to make you who they think you should be rather than who you are. So that's a persecutor in disguise. It can be really hard to spot and understand and again, this also links to the covert narcissist as well. So in this situation, the, the victim of this persecutor slash saviour will feel confused and angry at themselves probably. They see no reason for them to be the way they are. The persecutor, this person that's with them, is so good and right and why, um, why can't I be the way that I'm supposed to be? That kind of thing. So saviours often jump to persecutor in this way. And the other thing that happens here as well is where, is where um, the, the saviour gives and gives and gives, as we've discussed in the last podcast, everything, you know, everything they have, they, they give of themselves. And then they get angry and resentful and start to take it out on other people. They flip to the persecutor. It doesn't matter what I do for you, it's never enough. Why won't you accept my help? Why won't you just do as I say? Because I know best. I know what's best for you. Why can't you just listen? I'm here to help you. That kind of narrative. That's where the saviour flips to the persecutor. And also, from there, to the victim. Oh, woe is me. Why don't you ever listen to me? You don't trust me. That kind of thing. So you can start to see how all of these roles really are interchangeable and kind of flip. They flip around. And when we use the word persecutor or perpetrator, it kind of makes us think of the classic um, overtly aggressive persecutor. But there are many ways to persecute other people. There are many ways to be in that role. And some of them are quite hidden and some of them are quite difficult to spot. And when somebody says to me, I'm not a persecutor, I don't believe them. <laughs> I've never met one person, I have never met the Dalai Lama, but maybe he's one, and, and I include myself in this. I haven't met one person ever in this lifetime who does not exhibit some of these traits. Now, it may be very mild for you, but it might not be as mild as you think. So have an open mind when you're thinking about these things. Now, let's have a chat about the inner persecutor. 
the, the this idea that um, what drives a persecutor? How how do people end up being like that and exhibiting these behaviours? What happens? Okay, so often a persecutor has issues with the way they view themselves. So when persecutors have strong negative beliefs about themselves, the internal negative negative voice can be very powerful. The inner critic can take on many voices, the voice of a parent, a teacher, a bully. It can be your own voice. Whatever shape or form it takes is, is very negative. It can be loud and forceful, shouting your lack of worth at full volume. Or it can be quiet a continuous monologue of your thoughts and feelings that you don't even really notice are there. So there's two parts to talk about there. That, that's the inner persecutor. So you persecute yourself. But what that also does is it, it leads to projection, the projected persecutor. Behaviours that we exhibit are often a projection of our own inner turmoil. So Unconscious or subconscious discomfort can lead people to attribute unacceptable feelings or impulses to someone else to avoid confronting them in themselves. And I guess, in a way, projection in that way allows allows the difficult trait, the thing that you're struggling with, to be addressed without the without you fully recognizing it in yourself. People tend to project because they have a trait or desire that's too difficult to acknowledge. Yeah, that's how that is. So that's often what drives a persecutor. Rather than confronting their own shadow, they cast it to the side and onto someone else. And I guess this functions to preserve self-esteem, make difficult emotions more tolerable. It's easier to attack or witness wrongdoing in another person then confront the possibility in one's own behaviour. And how a person acts towards a target of projection or persecution might reflect actually how they feel about themselves. So, I thought that was quite interesting. One way to start to overcome these things is to, to, to think about Refusing to be superior or in, or inferior. So all of the roles in the drama triangle re- require one person to be superior, right, good or better than another person. Yeah? This one-up, one-upmanship game has to stop in order for you to, to step out of the drama triangle. And to step out of the persecutor role that you may be um, exhibiting. One of the other things that sometimes happens can drive persecutor behaviours is when someone holds grudges. So if you're someone, you've been hurt by someone else, particularly someone you love or trust, it can cause anger, sadness, confusion, it really sits in your heart, makes you dwell on these situations with resentment, vengeance, hostility, for example, and it can really take root And I think sometimes if we allow the negative feelings of past grudges to crowd out positive feelings, I think we sometimes find ourselves swallowed up by a sense of bitterness or injustice. And that can really spill out and into our lives, causing us to act in ways that are less than desirable, to cause us to act as a persecutor because we're so hurt and angry and we're carrying this vengeance and resentment and there's nowhere for it to go. It has to go somewhere. And that can often come out in persecutor behaviours. And what is key there is forgiveness. Forgiving whoever it is that you're holding a grudge against. Now, I can go into forgiveness in a whole podcast, which I will probably do at some point. Um, I don't obviously have time to do it today. But people who hold grudges, who don't forgive have higher risk of heart disease, depression, anxiety, a a range of health issues. Some really interesting articles and um, research papers out now that you can read to show how detrimental to our health and well-being 
holding grudges actually is. And where forgiveness needs to happen, two things. You're not saying, by forgiving somebody, you're not saying that what they did is okay. Far from it. Forgiveness isn't for anyone else. Forgiveness is for you. Okay? So if this resonates for you, do some work around that. You can still have boundaries. You can still say no. You can still um, have the person removed from your life if that's what's happened. You can still not allow the behaviour to continue and forgive. You can do both of those things. So have a think about forgiveness when it comes to persecutor roles. Now the blame game is a big one as well. Um, blaming persecutors blame other people. There, there are a couple of my, some of the a couple of my favourite podcasts that I ever did were on blame. I can't obviously I can't remember the number off the top of my head. I should write these things down. Um, but if you go to the show notes, um, centerforshamanism.com dot com forward slash seventy two, then we'll put the links for these up. Otherwise, just scroll through um, and look for the drama, the drama podcasts. The, no, not the drama, the blame, the blame podcasts. But when we're in this relationship, this drama triangle, then we, we blame other people, persecutors especially. And breaking the habit of blame can be so challenging because we might not know how to ask someone to, to do something differently without blaming them or invalidating them. So giving directions and telling others what we want rather than blaming them for doing things wrong or invalidating invalidating them shows them how to be successful and feels a hell of a lot better. We're also a lot more likely to get cooperation that way as well if we're not chucking out the blame energy, which is horrible, right? And when we remove blame, then we're taking responsibility for our part in that. Are we projecting? Is this something I need to deal with? No, okay, this is actually, you know what? I, I am very triggered by your victim state. I am going to do this. I will ask, this is my boundary and this is what I need from you. And if the person chooses not to do that, then you can decide what to do about it, whether you choose to continue with the relationship or not. Okay, so there's a few things you can do to deal with. So a lot of this has been about, are you the persecutor? But what happens when you have to deal with a persecutor in your life? Well, that's very simple. Better boundaries. When you have, when you work with, when you deal with people who are persecutors, you need to have better boundaries. It's as simple as that. I bash on about boundaries all the time. It's one of my favourite subjects. And again, I've done podcasts on boundaries a few times. So go back and check out the those if you struggle with boundaries but things like name your limits like to yourself you can't set boundaries if you don't know what your limits are what you what is it that is actually acceptable to you be direct don't be passive don't expect people to know what's okay for you and then get angry when they don't when they get angry when they cross a boundary but they don't know what the boundary is that's unfair, actually, and can be in itself a passive form of persecution. How dare you cross my boundary? What boundary? I'm not a mind reader. I don't know how you think. I don't know what your world's like. So be direct. Be honest. Give yourself permission to be able to say, I deserve to have boundaries. This is okay for me. Practice self-awareness, which we all do with our shamanic work. Make self-care a priority. Look after yourself. Make sure your bucket's full so when these um, confrontations do occur, then you have the energy and the confidence to deal with it. And if none of that works, then you can ask for help from a friend. You can ask. You can decide that you need to take some therapy so that you can actually stick up for yourself. There's loads of different things that you can do um, to develop better boundaries. So like I say, go ahead and check out the podcasts on boundaries if that's something that 
will help you to deal with a persecutor in your life. When you deal with persecutors and you start to put up boundaries, there will be kickback, invariably. Um, And that's just something you need to be prepared for. But all of the steps that we take, all of these things we do to step out of the drama triangle are simply life-changing. There's no energy in a drama triangle when someone steps out of it. It's very difficult for that drama triangle to continue around you when you no longer give it any energy and you no longer step into it. It's likely the other people involved will take themselves off and find another um, willing member, which is fine. They can do that. But in some cases, what it does is it, it dissipates altogether. Relationships improve family dynamics improve, household dynamics improve and all because you were brave enough to take the step and say I am going to change these things, I am going to find out what's going on here and I'm going to make these changes. Okay so in the next section we will have a wee look at the types of things we can do to support ourselves shamanically with the perpetrator issue. So if you want to get a pen and paper and I'll see you in just a sec. Hi and welcome back to part two. So this week what I'd like you to try is I'd like you to try a journey with your guides to your inner knowing. Now that would be an an inner landscape journey rather than a outward journey. It's the same, it's it's all the same, it's just that you're kind of journeying to yourself rather than to any of the non ordinary reality worlds. If you feel more comfortable having it put into context then it would be a middle world journey because you're journeying to the spiritual aspect of yourself your own inner knowing okay and ask to be shown your relationship with persecutor energy okay so that could show you that you indeed are a persecutor and what that looks like it could show you that you are the victim of a persecutor it could show you that you it could show you many things. So be really open to one, the other, or both, or a combination of various things. And what that journey will do is it will help you to understand your role with this archetype and it will help you to see any work that needs to be done there. Right, so it'll be really interesting to see how how you go with that exercise. And the second exercise this week is a wee exercise, wee activity to help you to work with your boundaries when you're facing persecutor energy. All right? So this information is all in the show notes. You'll get that at centreforshamanism.com forward slash 72. In case you're trying to scribble this all down, it's all there in the show notes. Okay, so this is a list exercise. So I want you to list five things you'd like people to stop doing around you. For example, eh, I don't know, criticising work colleagues who are not there, who are not in the room. I'd like you to list five things you want people to stop doing to you. For example, being rude or inconsiderate or ignoring you, for example. And then list five things that people may no longer say to you. For example, oh, you always give up or you'll never get promoted or whatever. So those are lists of things that you no longer wish to be around you in your energy field. And simply by stating those, what you can start to do is you can start to observe how often it happens. It really brings it to the front of your mind and it will really help you to connect more clearly with the why of boundaries. Why do I need to have boundaries? Why is that something? Why do people bang on about it all the time? If you're good with boundaries anyway, but you struggle with persecutors, then listing these things out will help you to know when to implement your boundaries. Ah, I've got this on my list. So this is what I need a boundary here. And you dip into your boundary tool, your boundary toolkit. All right. So I hope you find that activity useful this week. Um, I've really enjoyed this series, the Drama Triangle series. It's been quite eye-opening for me. I've done this work a lot, 
like I say, I've run courses and um, various other things with people when it comes to the drama triangle and, and the archetypes. But I, you know, I always try and research my podcasts and read more and learn more. And, and I did learn more this time. Even there's just layers and layers and layers to this work. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments in the Facebook group. And I'll see you all same time, same place next week. One last thing, I really encourage you to join my Facebook community. It's a beautifully safe space to discuss all things to do with shamanism and you are very welcome to join us in that community there. If that resonates with you, you'll find the link on the show notes for this episode. Much love and have a great day.